Greetings, everyone, and welcome to this bonus episode of the Hired Geek Podcast, episode number 115, with Julie Peller from Higher Learning Advocates, uh, talking all about uh, policy and how best to support student parents, as well as a uh, plethora of other student populations of more inclusive, progressive uh, policies. So, Uh, Julie brings in uh, just a wealth of knowledge and experience. Really appreciate her uh, reaching out to be on the show. Uh, It was really a great conversation, uh, very relevant uh, for our times now, for sure. Um, So other quick announcements. Uh, We just launched our Patreon. Um, So you'll find a quick note about that in the show notes uh, in the description of the episode. Uh, And then we also still have our merch store going. So please do check that out. Um, There's always great sales going on. So just keep an eye on the store. I always announce the sales here uh, when they are going on. But um, some cool stuff there. And we'll always be trying to put some new designs there uh, for you all to support the show there. Or... uh, you know, you could do both or either or uh, Patreon will have some cool exclusives there for uh, the folks who uh, support us there. So um, without further ado, though, this is the bonus episode number 115 with Julie Peller. So we are here. Uh, this is going to be a great episode, a timely topic, uh, focusing on a lot of things that are uh, uh, facing students right now, um, you know, especially during the ongoing pandemic uh, in this country and across the world. Uh, it's certainly things that are uh, going, you know, they've been going on beforehand and are going to continue going on, but this is kind of especially uh, kind of salient and kind of a relevant topic uh, for this current moment. So I'm so glad uh, to have uh, our guest here today that allow her to introduce herself and get started uh, to make sure we can have plenty of time to explore this topic. But uh, Julie, if you want to introduce yourself really quick uh, and give a brief overview of your professional journey of how you got to be where you are today, and then we'll move on to a bunch of other stuff. Sure. Thanks so much, Dustin. I'm happy to to be here and and I agree with you, this is a timely and pressing conversation. I'm Julie Peller, I'm the Executive Director of Higher Learning Advocates. I founded the organization just about four years ago with the mission to change federal policy to update for who today's students are. That was an issue that was pressing four years ago and is even more of a pressing issue now given the pandemic and all of the changes that are happening in higher education. got to founding Higher Learning Advocates based on my career as a congressional staffer and looking at what Congress is was considering and what was being, more importantly, brought to us uh, as we were reforming the Higher Education Act, other large reforms to, to student aid. We heard a lot from colleges and universities and a lot from traditional students but we didn't hear a lot from student parents, from working learners, from community college students who are really the fabric of so many of our um, institutions and landscapes in higher education and really felt that they needed a voice and they needed an advocate in Washington to uh, to make sure that policies reflected their needs as well, not just that 18 or 19 year old playing Frisbee on the quad. Yeah, I think that, that's uh, very important. And I think it's definitely certainly a context that is unique to me and in my experience and people that I know and just to the show really of like kind of coming in at that angle of like, uh, cause I think I saw on your Twitter bio that like kind of being like, you know, policy wonk kind of thing of like, it's, it's really important. It's really impactful to have like, you know, these sweeping legislative changes that allow for, um, I know, like I saw recently with like, um, the recent COVID relief package of like changes to uh, Pell Grant eligibility for uh, incarcerated uh, students and stuff like that. So like, it's the idea that like it is, that's huge, you know, like, and, and the idea that like advocating to make sure that uh, all sorts of policies regarding higher ed are, uh, you know, supporting, like you said, like who makes up the majority of current students, you know, these students who really are trying to uh, realize that, uh, kind of dream of the potential and the promise of uh, higher education to uplift people to uh, where they'd like to be. So um, I guess, yeah, I mean, it, it, I know you, yeah, you mentioned that you have a very uh, kind of long background on that kind of uh, more legislative side, but I guess um, I'm, I'm just curious because I guess it, uh, kind of confirm my understanding too, because it, it sounds like you're sort of like, you know, think tank just, yeah, you're kind of giving that uh, uh, kind of consultative uh, uh, point of view to, um you know, representatives in government and everything like uh, it sounds like that really is kind of what your background is, but maybe even just like how you sort of happened into uh, higher education being your focus. Like, was that like a willing choice or was that something that you kind of maybe just like stumbled into? 
So, you know, I think like many people in their careers, I kind of stumbled into it. Uh, the issues of education and uh, opportunity for uh, through the power of education is something I've always been passionate about. But the beginning of my career was actually in K-12 education. Um, I, my first job out of graduate school was with the Department of Education focused on K-12 uh, reforms. And that's really where my background was. Um, but I had the opportunity as part of the, I was part of a presidential management fellow program, which is kind of this government um, program to bring in people out of graduate school and give them extra training and opportunities to come into the career service. Part of that is a, um, a rotation or kind of an internship in your first two years. And that's where I went to Capitol Hill with the Committee on Education and Labor. The spot they happened to have open was higher education. Um, and it was really there that I saw the power of uh, federal policy and the importance of uh, uh, higher education and the, the what those two combined could do. Uh, so I did kind of happen into, um, into higher education. At the time, higher ed was mainly a finance policy. We talked a lot about student loan interest rates and um, subsidy rates to private banks. Um, and I also have a budget background. <laughs> so that kind of that kind of fit. I'm happy to say that the conversation has much evolved in higher ed. Uh, and now we talk about outcomes and opportunities for students as much as we talk about student loan interest rates for banks. And uh, so that's a happy evolution. But I did kind of happen into it. Um, I like to say that my seven years on the Hill was the longest six month internship I've ever had uh, because I came up there and just and just never left. Um, and so I, I between Capitol Hill and here, um, I spent some time as the director of federal policy at Lumina Foundation, uh, which uh, is, you know, the perhaps the largest foundation in the country that focuses solely on these issues of higher education, of increasing talent, of connecting pathways in the post-secondary space for students. And so there I was able to bring kind of that deep legislative knowledge to see all of the innovation that's happening across the country and find the connection um, between how we could scale or replicate or bring new voices into a pretty insular DC conversation. Um, and that's a value that I hope I bring to higher learning advocates as we push um, and, and push an agenda and push our policies in this uh, in this policy context. Well, yeah, we'll, we'll spend a minute here as well of higher learning advocates where, you know, uh, like you said, you're doing this work of uh, bringing those voices in and everything. And um, again, yeah, I mean, it just sounds like, I guess, from the jump, like you've always just been like, you know, uh, really focused on the policy and all that, like, it's just everything kind of leading to this moment of really being, you know, well positioned to do this work too. But um I guess maybe if you just want to give examples, because I think, you know, you've kind of explained like just the overall architecture of uh, higher learning advocates, but like uh, maybe examples of things that you've been uh, focusing on over the, the four years that you've been doing this work of uh, the things that you, you know, you are seeking to achieve through the, the uh, you know, bringing those voices in and uh, speaking with people on the Hill. Absolutely. So this past year in particular, uh, the needs of today's students became on the forefront. And we've really been pushing for, for three things uh, this year alone. The first is need for emergency aid. So for a long time, you know, policymakers and institution leaders have thought about college costs as tuition and textbooks and uh, maybe meal plans on campus. But students often get tripped up by emergency costs that, that come about. You know, their parent gets sick and they need to fly home uh, or their car breaks down and they can't get from uh, campus to work or home to campus. Uh, and those things can stop a student's academic journey. In this environment, when suddenly all students needed to, to return home, uh, those needs were even more great. And so we've been pushing for emergency aid assistance and, and were successful uh, in federal support 
for emergency aid assistance so that institutions can help students with those costs that come up and that they don't have to drop out of school as a result of them. Uh, Another thing that we've been um, advocating for this year is equitable access to broadband and internet. Again, as students went home, uh, their access to internet was very inequitable. Some had, you know, fast broadband and can get onto Zoom and, and do their coursework just fine. And others were writing term papers on their phones in parking lots of McDonald's. And uh, certainly there's an advantage to the students that, that have that ability at home uh, or in, in, a, in a safe place um, rather than trying to make it work. And so we, at the end of the year, were um, able to secure some, some assistance for students to be able to level that playing field and make sure that uh, in this environment where we're all working and learning and, and being at home a lot more, that getting online is as critical of a, of a need for higher education as um, access to, to dollars for tuition. The third thing we've been pushing for this year, and this is really where we, um, uh, an example where we're bringing in voices that weren't otherwise in the conversation, is highlighting the need of student parents. Student parents are kind of, I think of uh, like the bleeding edge of uh, student needs, particularly in this pandemic. You know, they're they're facing issues with childcare, issues with work, and a changing nature of higher education. And mm-hmm. many don't think about parents as students, but it's almost one in four of uh, students today who is a parent themselves. And so we've been talking with advocates and those who work with student parents uh, across the country and do research on student parents and thinking about how we can support them, how federal policy can be changed to recognize this population and support them going forward. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely all, you know, really important areas and kind of, you know, feeding into each other uh, in different ways, I'm sure. But um, I guess, yeah, I mean, you're kind of getting to, just capturing, you know, tangibly, because I think we're kind of speaking offhand or, you know, sort of anecdotally about the current landscape uh, for student parents and, um, you know, issues they might be facing. So we can kind of just like, get, you know, get right into those topics. So um, if you want to give a snapshot of, uh, you know, more kind of just, you know, kind of figures or just sort of ways to kind of capture uh, the current landscape for student parents uh, in higher education right now, um, and just some of those issues that you see that they're facing, uh, which again, I'm sure, you know, the other uh, kind of points of focus that you mentioned and kind of lead into here, but yeah, just talking through that a little bit and then we'll, we'll move on from there. Sure. So like I mentioned, you know, student parents are um, about a quarter of students on campus. Um, I, I think of them as often an unseen population because they don't generally show up on campus with a kind of, I am a parent sticker, but it's one in four. Um, so that's about 3 million students and uh, on top of that, so many student parents, um, about half of them are students of color, and a lot of them are single mothers. And so they're facing, like I said, uh, not only the challenges of being a student in this time, but uh, the challenges of being a parent and often a lower income or single parent in this in this time. Um, they're dealing with childcare costs where, you know, in more than half the states, that's more than tuition on top of uh, their their tuition and higher education costs as well. Um, and so they're likely to be uh, more likely to have uh, higher student loan debt. They're, they're more likely to have unmet need um, in order to kind of make ends meet at the, at the end of the day. You know, a lot of these things, it's like, there's not necessarily new problems in the age of the coronavirus. It's like accelerating or kind of uh, uh, expanding, you know, things that were already there. So like, it's almost like making it clear, like, okay, you can't ignore, you know, people not having access to reliable uh, internet at home or, uh, you know, students struggling with just monthly costs and bills and those sort of things. And um, just the need for kind of flexibility and, uh, you know, th- those different needs for uh, student parents. And 
we can spend a kind of a, a moment too of like really digging in because I know students of color like just and then you know student parents of color like I can only imagine because I've, I've seen a lot you know the continued conversation around uh, things like uh, canceling student loan debt uh, would be something that is like you know hugely impactful more so for students of color because like you said they're probably going to be taking out more uh, student loan debt to cover all of those additional costs so that they can attend um, so you know, looking at it through that lens of like, wow, okay, you know, it can be especially impactful for this group that is, again, trying to kind of realize that potential and the promise of, uh, you know, going through higher education, getting that credential and kind of having that be able to open doors and everything. So um, I guess if you want to speak to to that a little bit more of like those disparities, because I think sometimes it is like you're just looking at like one figure and you're like, well, wait, a, you know, wait a second, certain groups are grossly overrepresented in terms of like, yeah, like who has the most student loan debt or um, who has debt and no credential to show for and those sort of things. So anything that I guess you can talk about there of just kind of uh, highlighting those disparities and understanding kind of the uh, the urgency of the the need here. Absolutely. And I think you hit on the, um, the biggest one when we think of students financing higher education. Uh, you know, it's not just for the time that they're in higher education, particularly those who are relying on student loan debt. And we know that students of color are much more likely to, and particularly Black students, are much more likely to rely on student loan debt in order to make that financing work. And that impacts their families, not only while they're in college, but after college, which makes it so much more important for key outcomes like completion, like earnings and employment to to be there for those students. And unfortunately, we also see the disparities on that end as well, where uh, you unfortunately, students of color are, are um, not completing and repaying and earning at the, at the rates of their white peers. And so it's both kind of an incoming question of how, how we talk about financing as an equity disparity, as well as let's look at the outcomes. We can't just look at averages anymore. Uh, we need to start looking by, by race and ethnicity, by uh, populations such as student parents or adult learners or working learners um, and and really target solutions to be able to address address and um, those inequities in the system because they are they are system problems. They are not individual student problems when it's been happening for so long and in such a widespread manner. It's really time to take a look and say, how can, institutions, policies, and practices really change to to close that close that gap. Um, you know, one thing that you did say that I, I um, would just want to lift up is, you know, in this time of the pandemic, I think these inequities are so much easier to see. And we're literally in people's homes uh, in a way mm-hmm. that we weren't before. And, and I hope that that kind of that empathy and seeing people as people and seeing their struggles that they may not have brought up before, right? A, a student parent or a low-income student might not have thought of that window or that faculty member to say, hey, listen, I, I can't do this exam because my kids got strep throat and I was up all night, or I can't pay back my, pay my library fee this, this semester, but it's because I need to keep my lights on or I need to feed my kid. Those aren't conversations that are easy to have and they've been incumbent upon the student to have. But I hope that one longstanding thing is, is that we now see these inequities. Um, we see these issues that students are facing and, um, I hope that institutions and policies that continues, uh, even if we get past get past the pandemic and we're all back on campuses, uh, mm-hmm. we start we continue to see people as people and not just kind of student robots who show up on campus. Well, yeah, I just want to like sit with that for a minute too because I was just speaking with a colleague and just that experience sometimes where, and I think there's a lot of things kind of embedded in this, and maybe this kind of we can spend a little time on this too of just like maybe your experience, but like you know, just sort of, yeah, the bureaucratic power structures of higher education and like, you know, students just, especially right now, just so desperately wanting to kind of do the right thing and show up and be successful and all that to where they're, they'll, you know, and this is almost a 
you know, tragically like sometimes true, but also kind of exaggerated example of where like, you know, they would be like in the back of an ambulance and be like, I'm sorry, I can't like, you know, be on video for my live session, but I'm going to sit on even though I just like broke my leg or something, you know, like, and it's just like, no, you're going to the hospital. Just like talk to me later and get, you know, get better. What Like the idea that like they will try to surmount all these things and just like grit and bear it. And it's just like, yeah, trying to be more human, trying to be more accessible and flexible and, uh, you know, just, just, you know, empathetic to these students and everything that they are, uh, dealing with and um yeah like and then that idea where it could be like well you know yeah i've got a hold of my account i can't register for next term because of a library fee that is the only thing preventing me from registering you know i've got everything set up and good to go and just like that one little like strategic intervention of like okay yeah cool yeah we'll pay that fee for you and Mm -hmm. you know you're good to go and can persist and you know so and i think it was like what you're saying before too like there's a big financial piece of this like that that's kind of the umbrella that kind of shadows over uh, everything that we're talking about but yeah i mean at the end of the day it's like yeah you've got you know things paid for, you know, your tuition and uh, some of those other financial pieces. But, um, you know, we need to make sure that you're successful in your classes, that you pass them and that you graduate. And then also that you're prepared uh, to put your best foot forward, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, career uh, career preparation, just knowing how to navigate, finding the types of jobs that you want to get and those sort of things. So like, there's that space too of like, uh, the support resources. And I know, like, you know, I, I, I work in, uh, student success coaching for online graduate programs and just seeing like how beneficial that is to have somebody who's just like right there with you and kind of, you know, cheering you on from the sidelines, but also like giving you that kind of counsel, like, Hey, well, you might want to go about this, this way. And that thing, you know, still ultimately, obviously it's the student always, you know, performing and uh, succeeding in their courses and everything, but just seeing how impactful things like that are to help those people who need it most to, uh, you know, not just afford uh, their, uh, you know, education, which again is a very, large piece, but, uh, be successful and get everything that they need, uh, to be, uh, able to persist and retain and all that good stuff. But, um, yeah, I guess anything, anything that comes to mind for you there of just sort of like, cause yeah, this is almost like in the weeds, like the kind of micro pieces of it, of like, you know, just yeah, students trying to navigate, you know, often it's just very complex bureaucracies of higher education and stuff like that. And, you know, again, just like the disparities, you know, uh, I'm sure showing up here as well. Absolutely. And I think it is in the weeds, but it is, I think the solutions can be both small and systemic at the same time. Uh, You know, I think the hardest thing to both change and the most impactful thing to do is to change culture. Mm -hmm. When you think particularly about first generation learners, or I, I keep coming back to the student parent population of people who either don't have uh, family or community networks that have been through the system before who can say, hey, you know, you could call your, there's, I'm sure, an office of student success on campus, or um, it, you can reach out. It's it's okay and appropriate to raise that you're in the back of an ambulance. You, you can't come to class today. They're not going to kick you out for that. They'll hopefully be willing to work with you on it. That door needs to be opened um, and it, and uh, shown to a lot of students that that's okay. You know, I think that um, particularly for for students who have been um, historically underrepresented on campus, you know, again, low-income students, students of color, there's this uh, pressure on the individual student to fit this idea of what the bureaucracy or the system of higher education looks like. And, I, and that does not mean... Um, an openness to bring the, their kind of quote unquote outside uh, aspects of their lives into it. And I think the more that can be done to be clear to students that institutions have their success at heart, and that means helping them navigate the system and, and dealing with the complexities and listen, everybody has things that come up, right. And, And um, so that can look like a faculty member reaching out that can look like an office of student success um, or a that can look like a a, an advanced data warning system like a Georgia state has. Right. It could be Mm -hmm. small and it can be big, but it all comes down to seeing their students as people and being a resource to help the students get to the finish line while they're um, on campus, either on person or virtually. Well, when we're kind of talking through, you know, just some of those like, examples of things that can be done to be uh, 
you know, acting as a kind of good actor uh, in this space. So I, I, we'll kind of sit with this for a minute of just like, uh, hey, we've, we've talked a lot about the problems. So let's, uh, you know, move to the solutions. Because yeah, there's, there's, I think like, a treaded path that I think, again, it, it's trying to change that culture and kind of uh, making sure uh, faculty and staff are following through on the expectations of being, uh, you know, the flexible and accommodating and empathetic and those sort of things. But um, so if you want to give any examples, you know, we can, we can spend time on both, but uh, start where you will, because uh, my brain's kind of thinking of like, you know, how you've seen institutions responding positively to these issues. And then maybe, you know, again, there's uh you know, that, that, that policy piece that I kind of want to include here of maybe anything that you've seen happening lately uh, on the policy level that's been reassuring or, or, you know, maybe what you're uh, hopeful for or whatever. But um, I guess, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll start with the institutional piece. Anything that you want to just kind of emphasize in terms of like just some examples of other things that you've seen uh, have kind of positive impacts um, with all the things that we've mentioned. Yeah. So on campuses, you know, I think some of the best I- examples that I've seen really fit the the specific community's needs and really listen to remember what's going on um on campus. Um, so take, for example, um, Leech Lake Tribal College in Minnesota. You know, they opened a drive through pantry uh, to, to kind of help students as well as their wider um, community, given uh, where they're situated um, during, during the pandemic. And so that they kind of saw that as a community need and not, um, not just a student need. Others, uh, have done things like um, family-friendly campus toolkits um, uh, or um, opened up, you know, kind of a child care center on campus or um, a food pantries on campus for students that have really met, tried to meet those basic needs for students. Another campus, kind of kind of campus-based solution that I, I find is really interesting is uh, a new um, platform that was so released this spring, which was incredibly timely, uh, that helps students navigate kind of changes to their financial aid uh, picture called Swift Student, where you know students can appeal their financial aid uh, information to to campuses. Say you know they lost a job or their parent lost a job or there's unforeseen healthcare costs or something like that. Uh, but that process is really wonky, even for a wonk like me, uh, and really hard for students to navigate. So what Swift Student did was they created a you know, a form um, and kind of through a click through, students could go through the platform and write that appeal to their financial aid office and it helped help them navigate through that system. And I think, so while that's not a, a specific on-campus solution, that's a great example of how just helping the students navigate the rights that they already have can really help uh, change a picture for for individual individual students. That's great to hear. We'll definitely link out to that. Um, and then, yeah, I guess anything, you know, because I, I guess that uh, the Swiss students sort of in that vein of just like, you know, things that you're sort of uh, seeing that are kind of giving you hope or, you know, it's just seeing good examples of ways to uh, support uh Cause yeah, I mean, honestly, like, like we're saying it kind of, uh, our uh, initial focus really is like student parents were like all of this applies to, but it really is ap- applicable to, uh, I think you listed off kind of the, the whole, uh, kind of, uh, you know, litany of other kind of populations that really are needing this, uh, level of support who, who are, you know, just frankly, the, the students who benefit the most from higher education, this current moment of making sure they have the right skills and education to, you know, get the jobs of tomorrow. But, um, you know, anything else like policy wise that you see that like, uh, cause I know again, like there's stuff that was in, uh, the most recent, uh, COVID relief package or things that you're hopeful for with like a new administration coming in. Um, yeah, just kind of on that more like policy side. Um, then we'll start to kind of close out with a couple of, a couple more things. Yeah. So on the policy side, I, I mentioned a little while ago, um, the this issue of emergency aid and this emer- mm-hmm. emergency grants and um you know the federal government provided some assistance beginning in march uh through the original cares act uh to uh six billion dollars to be sure that campuses had funds to provide emergency aid and they've since um and in that last package at the end of the year increased that amount that's a great need in this pandemic what i i'm hope i'm and i'm excited that 
the Congress and um, the Department of Education have acknowledged that need. I'm that need was there before the pandemic, and that need will be there after the pandemic. And so I'm I'm hopeful for the recognition in this emergency time, and I continue to push and um, want to highlight the permanent need for an infrastructure and support for those kind of things. Institutions and the way our federal student aid programs are set up don't currently really have a permanent infrastructure to support those kind of emergency grant programs on campuses. And I hope that um, that that'll be something of conversations going forward. Another place that I'm, I'm really hopeful for is um, Congress and, um, you know, the and I'm hopeful the incoming administration will think about how students fit into policies outside of federal student aid. You know, for a while, we've looked at Pell Grants and student loans and other programs on campuses as the only solution to meeting students' needs. But through the pandemic, we uh, were able to lift up students' needs in other conversations like access to broadband, like um, access to SNAP, that students were shut out of of those programs or were not just thought of as possible or, or um, needed beneficiaries in those, in those programs. And so I hope that that continues and, you know, we're bringing it back to student parents, things like expanding the child care and dependent care tax credit um, mm. or the uh, increasing support for the child care development fund. These areas that you don't necessarily think of students as a, as a core population, but they are, and they should be should be con- considered and thought about in these policies. And so I hope as we think about, and I think, you know, just today, the president is announcing as a kind of first step set of policies to think about economic recovery is how do we think about students, either current students or likely students or, or those who want to be students as potential beneficiaries to other sets of policies that meet basic needs and, and allow them the, the time, the space, and the financial resources to be able to kind of further their education. Yeah, because it is fascinating, just like, it, it, now that it is really laid bare, and uh, thankfully, I feel like the momentum's moving in the right direction, where it's like, like for whatever reason, like tax policy is just like, oh no, you can't be both. You can't be both a student and a parent or sort like different things like that. You know, like it's just like, why not? Why like what? I don't understand. Um, exactly. Or in a lot of, you know, and I think this a lot of the basic needs conversations really um focus on people working or looking for work. And we don't think about education as part of that pipeline. You know, we think about training very, very short term targeted training as part of that pipeline, but not often a longer term pursuit in higher education as something that's kind of on par with looking to get ahead. Uh, and and how can we start thinking about that differently? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's just really modernizing and kind of uh, interweaving uh, all these things, these policies and stuff so that, uh, you know, everybody gets the benefits that they are entitled to. And uh, because I even think it was stuff with like um, some of the, the, you know, the stimulus parts of the COVID relief or I think there was sort of uh, ineligibility for students, stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, there's just so much work to be done here. And thankfully, uh, it seems like there's some uh, awareness and uh, kind of appetite for, uh, you know, making these changes, which, uh, yeah, it's definitely reassuring. Um, but as we wind down, um, and I think we've got uh, some great resources already, and certainly we'll have ways to connect with you and higher learning uh, advocates, uh, uh, you know, to keep, kind of keep the conversation going and check out everything that you all have uh, on your site. But any other like resources, like books, podcasts, articles, things that have been uh, grabbing your attention lately, or just like kind of good, like foundational pieces if folks want to kind of uh, build up their understanding of, uh, uh, you know, adult learners, student parents, and all the above. So, you know, I, like to put in a plug for my former employer of uh, Lumina Foundation. You know they they do a lot of work uh, on this uh, population, and in particular, their their magazine um, it has great student profiles uh, and lifts up, I think, a lot of the interwoven issues of students. And this is why it's hard to stick with one population because student parents are 
also working parents or working learners and, and adult learners and low income students. And it's all kind of combined. But the, the Lumina Foundation Focus magazine really does some really great reporting on what um, what's going on uh, there. Uh, when we think about student parents, you know, I always go to the Institute for Women's Policy Research and uh, as the standard bearer of research on what student parents are facing, how they're interacting um, both with um, being parents and being students. And so I would highly recommend checking that out. And then one more um, kind of more direct service organization, but is is certainly up and coming on the the policy space and um, is is a great resource is Generation Hope, which is a, a organization based here in Washington D.C. that works with uh, student parents and helps them does that student support side uh, and really helps them navigate that system. And they're they're an incredible organization to watch. Uh, and to learn from and and listen to of what their fellows are are facing and what solutions are really helping them. Yeah, great stuff. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll definitely link out to all that. Um, and we will end the episode as we always do. Uh, if you just want to share some final thoughts on this topic, uh, I feel like it's. Yeah, I mean, there's just a lot of complexity uh, to it, but you know, I think we're seeing some clear paths forward of things that can be done. And uh, I feel like you're one of the, you know, the folks in your team, obviously on the front lines, kind of, you know, inch by inch, uh, trying to make some progress here. So I uh, certainly appreciate you, uh, you know, for committing to doing that and everything. But just uh, final thoughts, anything that you'd like to close on, any kind of calls to action or anything, uh, whatever you'd like to end the episode on. Uh, so, you know, I think this week um, is, especially in federal policy, uh, a lot of new beginnings. And I'm very excited and hopeful that among those new beginnings, today's students uh, are now central to that conversation. They're part of the picture of who who higher education is and who it should be for. Uh, and I think that as, listen, Congress and the Biden administration have quite a bit to do, but today's students are part of the solution. And when they think about COVID recovery, when they think about economic recovery or issues of racial justice, today's students are issues, the policies that can help them are part of that solution. Uh, and, and I'm hopeful that that's We've seen that progress and we'll continue to push for it in the coming year because their needs are great and their potential is even greater. Absolutely. Great way to end the episode. And thank you so much, Julie, for all that you've shared. And again, for all the work that you and your team does. And uh, like I said, everything that we talked about will be down in the show notes to check out. And uh, thank you so much for your time. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for listening to this episode of the podcast. Make sure to rate, review, and subscribe so you never miss an episode. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you in the next episode of the Higher Ed Geek Podcast.